So welcome uh, to the Sustainable Kashi Free Permaculture class. We like to do these classes as a way to connect each other and connect us all to our ecosystems here in this disconnected time of COVID. Uh, Sustainable Kashi is proud to host these classes every week to help us all connect to the ecosystems. So we are located, uh, Sustainable Kashi is in Sebastian, Florida um, on an 80 acre retreat center. Uh, we have nine different demonstration gardens in which we show people different ways to grow plants um, using different methods. So we record all the hours of work we put in and we record all the food that we take out and we show you what you can predict to get uh, using different uh, methods of farming. Uh, we also have an off-grid eco-village in which we show people how to connect to alternative energy, rainwater catchment, uh, tiny house villages. Uh, we do a lot of frugal living workshops. So we can uh, explore many aspects of permaculture here uh, on these calls and at Sustainable Kashi. Uh, today, we are really excited to be talking about mushrooms. And we asked the question earlier how we're using mushrooms in our current property and current projects, but the truth is, is you're all using mushrooms in your property, whether you know it or not. So that's the beauty of the mushroom is it doesn't care if you're aware of it, it's there. Um, and it's what's keeping this cycle going. Uh, mushrooms have really played an important part of human history. Uh, we found the remains of humans actually carrying uh, birch polypores over 5,000 years old. So these guys were actually using these mushrooms for either fire tender or different purposes uh, for thousands of years. And that's just pretty cool. Uh, mushrooms have had the functions and our evolutions all the way from shamanic visions where we'd actually tell the future to uh, making hats and omelets. So mushrooms are pretty multi-purposed and uh, I'm super excited to introduce Caitlin Fogarty who has uh, extensive experience. I've actually enjoyed talking mushrooms with Caitlin because she's far above my uh, understanding of this amazing uh, world of mushrooms and I love to talk to people who know more than me. Um, so she has her own company known, uh, called Regenerative Designs LLC, where she uses permaculture design and organizes educational events and community action days as the program director of Orlando Permaculture. So we're super excited to have her here. And thank you, Caitlin, for spending your morning with us. And I can't wait to hear what you have to say today. Thank you, Terry. I'm happy to be here. Today, we're going to be talking about micropermaculture which is this sort of mishmash word, made up word of mycology and permaculture together. And I assume from this call who's here, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot about permaculture and what it is, but basically this is just my way of trying to make it so that when we do permaculture design or we're thinking about permaculture, we kind of put this mycological, mycological mindset in the forefront, we start thinking about mycology as our ally in this process. And I'm gonna make some bold claims about mycology, which is this whole queendom, this whole array of species and really awesome beings that are doing everything from creating soil to making a lot of your favorite foods beer and kombucha, they're involved in that process, that beyond all of the things you already know, fungi have some of the best potential to help solve a lot of our really nitty gritty problems that we're dealing with right now as a society. And it may seem like, well, mycology is so cool and, and it has all of these great abilities why don't we, we know about it? Why aren't we being taught about it in school? Why don't all of us know a lot of species and know their names and these types of things? And so I'm just gonna talk just for a brief moment, a little bit about fungi's history and, and where we're at before we dive in more to the hands-on type stuff. So if we go way, way back, billion years or so, one of the first really sort of evolved multicellular species on the whole planet. So every, every animal, every plant 
grandmother or great, 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 great grandmother was a fungi. And for a very, very long time, they were out there. They were the first decomposers. They were the first creators of the possibility of the rest of, of life. So they were really, rather than decomposers, I like to think of them as recomposers. So they're the ones that were turning minerals and rocks and just this kind of really inhospitable landscape into a place where plants and other organisms could thrive. And if we, we fast forward about well, many, many years to enter modern humans, so the first Homo sapiens, probably around 300,000 years ago or so, we start to see humans co-evolving with fungi in this really kind of cool way. And fungi, as humans have now kind of been shown, are biologically compassionate. And so I think a lot of us are having to do some unlearning in our ideas about humans with new science and these types of things. Um, a lot of us maybe think about humans from something we learned in school about Darwin, where we think we are, um, you know, our species and a lot of other species are just sort of competing for survival of the fittest. And a lot of new science and new interpretations of Darwin have come out that say it's not the survival of the fittest actually that lives on forever and ever, it's survival of the most compassionate. And humans, just like fungi, have been doing that for a really long time. They've been surviving through this sort of mutualism. And they have a lot in common in that regard. And so we can, we can look at how humans and these fungi co-evolved and supported each other and we can try to say, you know, where have we kind of gotten off course? Back then, maybe they, they understood nature better. They were more, you know, uh, understanding of their role in it. And at a certain point, we, we have what I call the great forgetting, which is we suddenly don't see ourselves as a part of nature anymore. We're not part of the cycle. And a lot of maybe our current modern woes and things, I think, come from that mental dissonance, this idea that we can be above nature or we have to conquer nature. Um, and even if we look in um, some of our archaeological records, we see a shift where humans really revered mushrooms through these different artifacts as uh, you know, a means to tap into their intuitive side or tap into their nature understanding to later societies, um, and mostly I'm talking about Mesoamerica here, where mushrooms were part of the sort of um, human sacrifice type uh, situations that humans were specifically doing to earn immortality from the gods. So it, there was this great shift of where, um, you know, mushrooms, and it was potentially because people started doing different forms of psychedelics or just, I can't really hypothesize why these things happen, but we, we had this major great chasm of where we no longer saw ourselves as part of this cycle. And we started to, you know, build culture that no longer revered this interaction with nature, this being a part of nature, this revering of the cycle of death and rebirth. And um, I think we need to do a sort of recalibration of our understanding of that and our part in that, and we'll begin to step in the right direction. So let's dive into, I'm going to just briefly go over 
some of the really amazing things that mycology has the potential for. And then we're going to go into the more in depth about how to grow specific mushrooms here in Florida. So in terms of fungi, there's really lots and lots of great potential as medicine. So there needs to be a lot more research on a lot of species, but we do know there's things like lion's mane that have been shown to um, help, help serve, help or help regenerate uh, nerve growth. So a lot of us, or some of us rather have some nerve damage from different diseases and things. Lion's mane has been really effective at, at showing to regrow those. So for people that have things like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, this is potentially a, if not cure, a sort of agent in, in part of their healing process. Um, things like turkey tail have also shown uh, sort of effects as being immune cell boosters. So they're not cancer cures, but they're sort of, a, once again, like an aid in that process of healing. And then we even have people doing tests, um, trying to basically make novel treatments for individuals for diseases or viruses that are resistant to antibiotics, which is this big sort of weight over many people in the medical field these days. How are we going to help people heal once the you know antibiotics become not effective? And so there's even people finding different strands of fungi that can um, handle things like MRSA and uh, other normally now antibiotic resistant diseases. And there's just such a plethora of possibilities as, as sort of open source and even community-based medicine that gets rid of maybe some of this bureaucratic medical middleman um, that could make this more accessible to people all over. And then we can also use fungi for things like building homes or building um, things that we might use wood for, furniture and so on. And the amazing thing about this is fungi can basically take things that we would think of as trash. So carbon materials from landfills or just, you know, otherwise junk that people are going to throw away and turn this into really valuable items that we all need for our shelter in existence. And the number one mined mineral right now on the planet is sand for concrete uh, production, which is, if you haven't looked into concrete production, it's pretty, pretty terrible, the, the things that go with that. And so finding alternatives to be able to regenerate things that we think of as waste, fungi can be a great um, ally. There's also, lots and lots of new research coming about things like psilocybin being able to treat depression under other mental trauma there's even now a center in jamaica called blue portal which does guided um, sort of i'll call them guided uh, trauma treatment so it's um, you know very highly uh, considered of, of the person undergoing this experience and really trying to make it a healing experience. These are not, you know, um, sort of raves or parties. These are very much considerate um, guided experiences where there are counselors and, and, and therapists and people on board. And then we can also uh, remediate and capture toxins. So fungi, I'll get into a little bit later, are just superb at breaking down many, many toxins that we humans have created and put forth into the environment and should really be much more part of our permaculture design if we have livestock or animals, or especially people that live in urban environments to deal with things like past uh, pollutants in their soil and so forth. And then fungi can also help uh, ecological and community problems. So this is a photo of an opportunistic invasive plant called 
water hyacinth. Um, this is in Uganda, but we also have this, this issue here in Florida. A lot of our rivers, um, if we weren't spraying a lot of pesticides and things on them, like Wakaiva, would just be overrun with a lot of these opportunistic invasive plants because of runoff and other you know, issues. So we're really not getting at the root cause of, of these issues. We're kind of just band-aiding them. Um, and, and fungi in other ways could help actually treat the root of the cause. But for in this instance, we could also use this um, water hyacinth plant to grow mushrooms. And there's many uh, communities in Africa. There's, there's some um, women-owned mushroom farms, cooperatives that have popped up because their typical fishery livelihoods were put at risk and they've really been adaptive and creative and in figuring out how they can still have a livelihood and, and feed their families and um, use fungi as these allies in this process. And then of course everyone's least favorite aspect of fungi which is growing edible mushrooms and today we're pretty much just going to talk about how to grow oyster mushrooms and also a little bit about if you get your hands dirty today and, and over the next few weeks or months and you uh, want to really run with this, what are some of the things you need to be thinking about to handle any mushroom projects you have in the future or to dive further into this? And so Florida, we're so totally totally blessed about all the different um, fungi that we can grow here. We basically are able to grow fungi year round, just like many of us are able to grow food and, and plants year round. So we can grow all different things in the winter, like chestnuts and different oyster species and uh, garden giant and shiitake. And then we can also grow a lot of really yummy tropicals, tropical oysters, almond agaricus, um, patty straw mushrooms, all these really yummy things that, you know, some people may or may not have heard of, but are just really delicious and nutritious mushrooms. And if you haven't, um, you know, really dived into nutrition of mushrooms, I'm not going to spend time on that today, but I really encourage you to be, you know, go nerdy about it and, and read into that because it's, pretty amazing and off the charts. And especially if you're plant-based or somewhere around there, adding mushrooms to your diet is, is pretty awesome. And so we can grow mushrooms in Florida on so many different things. As you see in these photos, sometimes you also just have too many um, fungi and fungal friends and mushrooms just pop up everywhere in your life, which maybe we don't want. So mushrooms growing out of the side of our house or in our shoes may not be um, you know, the best for us, but it's possible. But, but mostly they'll grow on just about anything that you have um, that's almost a waste in your life. So things like paper waste or coffee waste, cardboard waste. Um, they'll also grow on lots of different types of agricultural waste. And I'm using this term waste in a very conventional way, but I really hope that we start to think about how these things are just resources out of place, which is a kind of cutesy way of thinking of it, and, and start to recycle them, get them back in this, you know, closed loop cycle, just like nature is. And that's how we're gonna be thinking about growing mushrooms, is growing them in this sort of closed loop, mimicking nature type of way. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about growing mushrooms through a permaculture lens. We're really trying to look at, okay, how does nature grow mushrooms? It's in this cycle, no one's coming in and importing you know, food for the mushrooms, no one's coming in and, and um, doing all these things. They're out in nature taking care of themselves and we wanna learn from that and bring that into our own system. And, and so, in a moment, I'm going to talk about bucket tech, which is this amazing way to get your feet wet, to really have good success 
and get some oyster mushrooms growing at your house. Um, before that, I do want to take a moment to talk about what I call mushroom parameters. So these are things that um, you don't really need to study today, but if you want to continue your fungi journey and you want to get deeper in this, then come back to these and start going through them because they'll really help you have success at um, taking on any mushroom projects or fungi projects you have in the future. And as you saw on some of those previous slides, there's such a big, big field of what mycology could be in your life. And these are some of the things you could be thinking about to do that. So really take time to observe and interact with your mushrooms. So uh, read books, go online, learn that way a bit, of course. But if the, the fungi you're looking into are a part of uh, your local environment, if they're an edible local native mushroom, you know, go out, be a part of uh, a guided walk or um, find a local group that does mushroom ID and go out and just pick their brain and check out your local, you know, flora and fauna and see where these mushrooms are growing, what they like to grow on, um, what types of conditions, you know, what's the temperature, what's the rainfall, are they growing up high in a tree, or are they growing down low on the ground? Um, were there any things that make sort of, sort of shock them into fruiting? So did you have freezing temperatures the night before or really cold rain? And you know, ask even the people that are out there foraging these types of questions. And many of them will probably know and they'll be able to help you start to put together these sort of likes and dislikes of, of these mushrooms. And because we are mimicking nature, you'll be able to take then those conditions and try to go and see, all right, where in my yard or farm can I put this mushroom system where these conditions already exist or I have to tweak things a little bit rather than, um, you know, all of us building a completely sterile um, addition to our house where everything is computerized and we have these um, humidity uh, creators and we have these like oxygen fans and we have all this stuff going on that's really high tech and, and costs quite a bit of money. Rather than that, we really wanna to try to grow mushrooms in a way that they're as much part of the ecosystem as, as we can. And so also just to talk a little bit about fungal biology. So if you do get in this and you, know, you wanna keep growing mushrooms, there's this idea of maximizing your mileage in the permaculture community. Paul Stamets created this term and it's this idea of sort of never just fruiting some mushrooms and then stopping there. It's always take that to the next level, turn that into more mushrooms or compost or food for something else. So never just sort of throw away this opportunity. And so in nature, we have these um, beautiful mushrooms pop up out of the ground when the time is right when the conditions are right. And whether they have gills or pores or whatever it is, they have spores as their reproductive means. And they release these spores out into the world. And if they, for instance, are a mushroom that grows on logs, they'll land on these logs and try to find an inn, try to find a place that they can get under the bark and start to grow. And once they start to grow, these spores, if we're thinking about it like a plant, basically become the mushroom roots or the mycelium. And they spread out through this log. And if you see in nature, a, a log that has mushrooms growing on it, often under the bark or at the ends, you'll see this white fuzzy um, kind of lines underneath, right in, underneath the, like the outer layer and that's a sign that the mushrooms have successfully myceliated that log. And then not much long after, after the log is completely run through with all these white fuzzies, 
we then, if the conditions are right, we start to see the actual mushrooms pop up, push out through the bark or the ground, wherever they are, and continue this cycle. And it's just on and on and on. The cycle continues for as long as this log provides food for the mushrooms. And so when we grow mushrooms in a bucket, what I call bucket tech, we're basically replicating that log situation, but we're using a bucket instead. So the bucket is providing all the same conditions as a log, and we're having to use very little energy. We're having to use very little tech, so you're not gonna have to buy expensive equipment or have access to a really sterile environment. And we're also going to close the loop because we're gonna either keep using this bucket for a really long time, or even better, if we can take a bucket that otherwise would have gone to the landfill and we could upcycle it to this um, practice, then you know we're doing good, good, good for everybody. And we're gonna be growing oyster mushrooms specifically in this bucket. Oyster mushrooms work really well for uh, beginners and, and really make sure that everyone has a great success because they're very aggressive and they eat so many different things. Um, and so let's see what our buckets would look like. So I'm gonna go over a few things that you would need definitely to get and have prepared before you started culturing or cultivating your mushrooms rather. So we need some type of bucket vessel. And, you know, like I said, you can upcycle this, you can um, buy it if you had to new. You wanna make sure that um, as best as possible, it only had food or sort of non-toxic um, things in it before. You know, stay away from buckets that had chemicals or other industrial waste. And you also need a lid that fits really well. And so these buckets, you want to go ahead and clean them with soap and water, make sure there's no debris left, and drill holes in a, a diamond pattern across the whole bucket um, that are about six inches apart. And generally, a half inch drill bit is, is what I recommend to get really nice sized um, mushrooms, but not too many. And then what are we going to feed our mushrooms? So like I said, we're going to be mimicking that, that log. And so we need basically any type of material that we can find, preferably that's free or that's going to otherwise be going to a landfill um, that we can use uh, to grow these mushrooms. And so we can do things like organic straw, we can do coffee waste, we can do um, you know, old cardboard, household waste cardboard. Um, we can even do invasive species that we've dried down that look very similar to um, straw when they're dry. The only thing I would say about this is for beginners, buying especially something like easy straw, which I have in this photo here, is already pre-chopped straw. It's already pre-fluffed up. Um, very minimal steps to get it ready. And so that may be something you all want to purchase for the first few times you do this and really get your hands wet and, and see that, you know, just how this process works. And from there, you can start incorporating other different types of, of food for the mushrooms or what we call substrates and get more into growing mushrooms in this sort of closed loop way where you're using things that you create that normally you would throw away to feed your mushrooms. The other thing is in growing mushrooms, we don't need to be sterile per se, but we do want to have a certain level of cleanliness. So when we start uh, cultivating our mushrooms, we generally want to have clean clothes on. Um, if we can have a mask, which many of us nowadays probably already have, it's good to wear that clean um, hands that we wash with soap and water. And then right before we start um, touching the actual mushrooms, we'll, we'll apply some alcohol. And we 
want to make sure we have uh, a clean, clean space. So a table that's been wiped down with alcohol and generally do this in an area where um, there's not a lot of human traffic or there's not a lot of um, any type of freeze or commotion so that we have the least amount of possibility of contamination coming into our site without having to use a sterile lab. And then as far as what type of mushroom you would grow, so we're talking about oysters today, but there are many different types of oyster varieties or cultivars. And depending where you are and what your, your temperatures are and when you want to fruit your oyster mushrooms, you'll need to buy a different type of oyster mushroom spawn. And uh, Field and Forest is, is a national company that will ship to you. They're really amazing. They make really, really good spawn. And they have oyster mushrooms that can grow here in the winter, that can grow here in the summer. Um, so you would just really need to decide what time of year you want to grow and then order that spawn that would be best. And they have a whole um, sort of list on their website about with, when each type of mushroom grows and you can use their resources as well. They're just a really amazing company. And then something we also need to prepare before we start cultivating our mushrooms is a fruiting space. So this can be like one of these things here. It also could be um, a, a shady place somewhere in your yard, maybe next to a pond or um, next to a really high moisture area. But in the beginning, I would really recommend to use a little extra plastic for the first few go arounds to have the most success to really make sure you understand this process. So that might look like, you know, setting up some, some little sticks like here on the left and creating this little community tent over your, your mushrooms or like in the middle photo where they have this kind of old metal apparatus holding up this plastic. Or even sometimes you can find these, um, in the mushroom world we call them Martha's, this little seedling tent here on the right. and. Um, you can just mist inside of that with water when we get to the fruiting stage because the fruiting stage really the, the biggest means of success and failure is making sure that your mushroom has enough moisture. So we're mimicking nature when mushrooms fruit in nature, the humidity is at 80, 90% is up there. And so even though we live in Florida, we think, oh, our humidity is really high, it fluctuates. And anytime we have that fluctuation, our mushrooms could start to grow and then die or shrivel up and not continue. So we do want to um, provide some stability in controlling that moisture level. And then, uh, you know, many people think that mushrooms like to grow in full, full darkness, but I think this is a, um, a myth that basically has been spread continued for all the um, mushroom fans out there that really like the idea that mushrooms are like a part of this maybe death cold or, or something like that. But mushrooms really don't like to grow in complete darkness. They um, definitely need some light, but not direct sunlight. So keep them in a place that's kind of shady, dappled light, and has enough light that you could still read a book. If you can't do that, and they will need more light or they'll start to get really laggy and, and not be super happy. And then one of the last things we need to do for cultivating mushrooms is we need to prepare our food or our substrate for our mushrooms. So sort of the easiest way the, the most beginner friendly and the least amount of energy or having to go out and buy equipment for this is something called pasteurization. And pasteurization basically just takes that substrate and it kills off some of the early competitors from, for the fungi, but it doesn't kill off the whole microbe. So 
in this way, it's really a good balance of having microbes that help the fungi, but allowing the, the, the mushrooms to get a little bit of a head start. And there's two ways we can do that, depending on really how much substrate you're trying to make. Um, if you have a big pot and a stove or a rocket stove, you can really easily heat up some water to around 160, 180 degrees Fahrenheit. That's water that's not boiling. We don't want to boil or sterilize our mushrooms or our substrate in this case. And so it's water that's you know really hot. Um, you can barely touch it. And we would want to lower our substrate into that and let it stay at that temperature for about two hours. And I find it really helpful to go ahead and put your substrate into uh, a pillowcase or some other type of, of, of vessel that'll make it easy for you to drain it afterwards. And then we can do that same pasteurization technique, but we can use water to anaerobically ferment the uh, substrate. And so this does the same thing. It kills off some of those early competitors to the fungi to give them a, a head start, but still allow some of that microbial life to persist. And it, both of these would be the same thing. You would, um, you would do this process and then you would hang them up to drain or drain and cool. And then we move on to inoculation. So then putting it all together. So we would make sure we have that really clean space and we would hang up our substrate, make sure it's drained really good. It still needs to be moist, but we don't want it dripping and make sure it's cool enough to, to touch. And then we would go ahead and lay it out on our, our clean surface and we would mix in, then open our bag and mix in our, our mushroom spawn with that and pack it back into our, our bucket. And it's really pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, we don't want to suffocate the mushroom. So we do want to pack it in and make sure that you know, mushrooms can't jump. So we want to make sure it's nice and tight, but we don't want to um, you know, be packing it in with a sledgehammer type of thing. And then we would just um, put the lid on the bucket, drape some type of, of plastic over it like I had in one of those previous photos. And then this is the mushroom running phase. So this is the phase where those little mycelial hairs are just taking off. They're gonna start running through that substrate. And in two to four weeks, depending on your um, climate, you can peek into your bucket very carefully with clean hands, and you should just see a white mass. And once that's happened, we can um, move it into the fruiting stage. And so we go back to one of those setups that we have, and we, we put our bucket in there, and we check it every day. We can spritz it with a spray bottle once a day, or some people even, you know, get more elaborate, they have these little um, electric humidifiers. Some people even run them off of solar, but simply just having a, a spray bottle and spritzing up inside that plastic bag once a day will, will get you success and your mushrooms will fruit. And you really wanna check them every day because mushrooms will go from these little guys here on the left in potentially a couple hours or a day or two to full-grown mushrooms here on the right, depending on conditions. And so you can think, oh, I just checked, checked you know, a couple days ago and your mushrooms might be past um, good eating at that point. So that's pretty much it for growing mushrooms in our bucket tech. Um, it's not, you know, it should be very beginner friendly. There's not a lot of ways to contaminate it or um, to go wrong if you if you spit the straw and you uh, make sure that you're you're clean ahead of time and you pasteurize your substrate. Um, those are really the the main three things that people um, have issues with, and and making sure that also you know that that substrate 
once again, is really, um, it's moist, but it's not dripping. Anytime we have extra moisture inside of this bucket during this process, we can really have um, contamination problems pop up. So check your shrooms daily and in no time you should have mushrooms. And then I'm just gonna go through this really briefly, but I just wanted to give you guys some ideas also about how um, microremediation or this idea of um, taking toxic situations in our environment and uh, remediating them through fungi as an ally. And so I have this picture because I think a lot of us more and more, we, we read the news and things and, and we hear about you know, new waterways or foods or even sometimes our bodies being contaminated by toxins and chemicals. And it's kind of this um, very uh, strange situation and era to be in. And we don't want to end up in bubbles, right, in the future. So what are some things that we can do to help clean up our environment and not be incorporating these toxins into our body? And microremediation or the um, allying with fungi to detoxify and regenerate our contaminated environments, I think is, is one of the best and easiest ways for us as individuals and also on a sort of community grassroots level to tap into this and to make big change with the least amount of work. And that's really important. And so I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit and just go over briefly. So these are the different spheres of micro remediation. So we basically have three areas that uh, these fungi can be allies and help us clean up environments. We have the, the chemical arena. So that is um, things you know, like petroleum, so oil spills in our rivers or oceans or other um, pesticides or herbicides running off you know, over land into the water or even just contaminating soil. A lot of those things can luckily be eaten and digested by fungi and the end product is completely benign. So we basically get new good soil and mushrooms and a little more carbon dioxide than we started with. So it's pretty miraculous what fungi can do. Fungi can also um, clean up biological contaminants. So like if we have a, um, a farm or something that has an issue with E. coli um, polluting our, our water downstream or our neighbors downstream just because there's maybe too high concentrate of, of, of too many animals in a small space, we can use fungi to help deal with that issue. And fungi can also even help clean up certain industrial waste. So even things like heavy metal, we're really not bioremediating them, we're accumulating them into the fungi. And so that's not, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult problem to handle, but at least we know that they now are in these mushrooms and we can try to dispose of them in a, a better way. And so that's why I have this, this photo. I think um, one of my teachers used this to, um, to just say fungi aren't witches and wizards, they don't have magic wands. So even um, though we think they can help solve all of our problems, things like heavy metals, um, you know, there's no silver bullet. We, we need to figure out better and newer solutions to handle those, but fungi can still be a pro, you know, part of that allyship for the time being. And so this is a slide of how fungi deal with contaminants or, or anything that they come in contact with. Fungi are actually super cool in that they, they don't eat like us and, and, and pull um, materials into their body into a digestive tract. They actually send exudates and, and these kind of um, scouts outside of their body to create enzymes to break down whatever that compound is in front of them and then take that newly broken down compound into their body when it's digestible. And that's what this photo is in this 
in the left here, um, if you see ever see this yellow kind of liquid in your um, in your grows, it's perfectly fine. It's the fungi doing their thing. This is them sending out those enzymes to break down whatever food they're eating. And we don't we don't know for certain, but it's estimated something like there are a million different enzymes that fungi can create to eat and dissolve and um, change compounds that they come in contact with. So that means if we have a million different problems, potentially there's a fungi out there that will eat or um, break down this food, which is pretty exciting. And then just two quick examples of, of this in action. So this is here a farm on the left. We would um, dig a trench and much like how we're growing fungi in our bucket tech, we would, with a few different steps, we would fill this trench with that um, mycelium. We sort of, we call it bunker spawn, which you can look up online if you're really interested in this. And this would basically be a catchment for these pollutants. So in, it, in this instance, it might be E. coli running down the, the bank of this hill in the rain and it would capture that E. coli, it would um, break it down into benign compounds and grow beautiful edible mushrooms. And then the water would continue passing by and be completely clean. So it's, it's pretty amazing and should be more part of our farm designs, our community designs. So there's much potential to, to do these types of things with very little cost and in fun, engaging community ways. And then the last thing is um, a small bit about chemical microremediation. So here on the left, this is a little bit of an oil spill. And here in Florida, we have lots of issues with um, oil spills in our Gulf. But even if you're just thinking at your home scale, many of us probably have um, cars that occasionally leak oil or um, you know, we see oil spots in our, our local parking lots or you know, we see little pools on the edges of lakes and things like that. So we can actually capture these oil spills um, in different ways and apply fungi to them. So many different types of oyster mushrooms have shown amazing results at breaking down hydrocarbons, which are the, the comp basic compounds of um, oil and turning them into benign substances. And uh, turning whatever that waterway or that soil into a clean environment that life can continue to flourish in. And we can apply this on local small scales, but we can also apply this on really large community scales. So there's some really amazing indigenous groups and mycologists working in the Amazon where places have just been you know, wrecked for many decades because of um, unethical oil uh, drilling and sort of just pouring oil off when it's convenient because of prices and different things and cleaning up those environments with great success. And one of them is called the, um, I believe it's called the micro renewal of the Amazon. It's a really neat study to check out if that type of stuff interests you. And the other great thing about this type of micro remediation, whether you're trying to clean up hydrocarbons and oil or other toxins is here on the left, we can go the route of, you know, trying to do this process and sending off our soil or our water to a really expensive independent lab. It might cost three or $400 and we might have to do this multiple times. And so that's, you know, great if we need to and we have those funds. But another way to check that's very inexpensive and it it's kind of aligns with our permaculture worldview is to add worms to say we have soil that we've cleaned up. Uh, we think we've cleaned it up. We've gotten all the oil out. We've gone through this process. If we add worms to it in small amount and they thrive and prosper and just love it, um, then we basically know these levels of oil or hydrocarbons are very low because worms are almost like this canary in the coal mine for um, certain chemical pollutants, they just will not tolerate it. They'll just start wiggling away very quickly. 
And so these can also be great um, partners in this process for us and how easy would it be for us collectively, communally, you know, grow worms out, share them and be a part of this process. And so, you know, eventually our goal is to re recreate this. You know, we all want to have beautiful, functioning natural environments um, in our in our homes and, and around where we live. And microremediation is just the first step. Um, there's other, you know, biologies and plants that come after that once we get that soil or that water cleaned up to restore the health of those ecosystems. And so if you're, you know, wanting to do that, there's many places you can look to understand bioremediation or plant remediation as an additional layer to microremediation. And it's just, it's just such a beautiful thing looking at um, newly restored habitats and seeing that we have such potential sometimes for polluting, but also as humans, we have such ingenuity and care and possibility to make things right and to clean things up. And that gives me a lot of hope. And then for any of you that want to nerd out more, I do have a little bit of a bibliography that you can look at some sources. And then if um, you want to get in touch, uh, if you're looking for permaculture type stuff and you're the, in the Orlando area, I really hope you will check out our nonprofit called Orlando Permaculture, which um, we have such gratitude and thanks to Terry as well, who also several years ago started the original Orlando Permaculture with a few others. And so we've just continued to carry that torch and hopefully do it in pride. And so we build community, we, we share permaculture skills. Um, we're doing a lot of online live exchanges right now because of current situations, but we hope later this fall to get back into local events and community meetings. And if you're in the area, please come out and join us. And then if you're interested in um, mycological type stuff for growing mushrooms, I have both my business page here and my personal Instagram, where I kind of shared different things about projects and um, successes I've had. And um, I'm also going to start putting up some more videos about some of the things that I've talked about today, hopefully pretty shortly once I um, get editing them. So that's what I have for today. Oh, Caitlin, you are a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for, for saying, I've really, actually I learned a few things in your presentation. I love learning new things in the presentation. So thank you so much. Um, could you repeat your email so people know how to get in touch with you? Sure, it's regenerative designs fl at gmail.com. Wonderful, wonderful. And I have a slew of questions for you. Okay. And um, so we're going to take those to our Facebook community page because it's a little tricky to answer them here, but I'm going to uh, cut and paste them into that uh, group and we can just answer them online with for each other. And uh, we are going to ask a question in that group today. And basically, if you just tell us what your biggest takeaway uh, from the classes, you'll be eligible to win a one hour consult with Caitlin to add micro permaculture into your project at home. So that is a very valuable thing. Uh, I'm, I'm a little jealous of that prize myself. So please uh, come over there and uh, Amy will paste the link on how to get there into the chat. And um, I want to say thank you, Caitlin for your time, your effort for this class. Uh, thank you, Amy, for doing all the back-end production of our class. Uh, we are switching um, to a higher Zoom call, so we'll be able to uh, get more people. We actually maxed out our current Zoom call, which is really great. Um, so if you feel like you got any value, please donate um, anything you can. If not, the classes are free. They're here for everyone as a way to connect to everyone. So we're, uh, we're so intricately connected in this orchestra of life together. And it is so nice to be here with you all. Uh, we could spend the rest of our lives studying the ground under one foot and uh, we'll never still understand everything that's going on. So uh, the complexity of the mushroom world really demonstrates this for me. Um, we as the apex species are responsible for the majority of the habitat loss, the sea level rise, the uh, 
uh, the, the deplete resource depletion on the planet, all of this, we, we, we play the lead role in this. So I believe it's extremely important for us to learn how to integrate the world of plants and animals and fungus to help human design uh, and, and implement a regenerative and abundant future for all of life on Earth. So thank you so much for joining us in this important topic, and we look forward to seeing you all next week, and uh, we'll see you in the Facebook community group. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Bye. Thank you, Caitlin. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. That was amazing. Yeah. I'll see you all in the group. Thank you.